Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I am so excited to welcome you all to another Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and of wonder to change our world. The very heart of the National Geographic community is of course National Geographic Explorers. Our explorers are cutting edge scientists, amazing researchers, talented filmmakers and photographers, and powerful storytellers. These Explorer Classroom events connect students around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and extended Q&As. We're now hosting Explorer Classroom every school day at 2 p.m. Eastern time in addition to all of our usual events. So if you'd like, I can see you right back here tomorrow for some more Explorer Classroom fun. But for today, we're very lucky to be connecting with Beverly Goodman. Beverly blends archaeology, geology, and anthropology together to explore the interaction between nature and humans on our coastlines. Today, we're going to learn all about how she's able to do science underwater through a combination of some pretty cool scuba skills and some very neat research techniques. We're also going to hear all about her work on ancient tsunamis, which I'm very excited about. Before we get to that, I want to acknowledge that we're joined on screen by tons of school groups today, which is really exciting. And we've got almost a thousand of you out there registered to watch along with us and send in your questions. I'm so glad to have so many of you out there. And um, I'm so glad to have you representing so many cool places. Today, our students are from Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, the District of Columbia, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Maryland, Maine, Mississippi, Minnesota, Missouri, North Carolina, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Nevada, New York, Ohio, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Puerto Rico, Rhode Island, Texas, Virginia, Vermont, Washington, and Wisconsin. Plus we have students in Canada and Japan and Romania and South Africa and the UAE and the United Kingdom. We've got students all over the place. I've got a couple of special shout outs to give to some student groups. We've got the A family, Abby, Adathia, Amelia from the Cousins Campus, Aya, Bella and Jonathan, Elizabeth, the Hinkle family, Cade, Kate H, Lisa's kids, Lila, Maria, Max, Mr. Aaron's seventh grade, Mrs. Downs Alpha class, Miss Ricardo's four fives, Nyan, Nick, the Filman family, Riley, Samara, the Shimke family, Singlins, Srihan, Stephen and Kara, um, the High End family, the Lincoln Magnet School, uh, Tiana Sermon, the Weekend Warriors, that's, that's so many of you, but I know I couldn't have possibly gotten all of you. There's so many of you out there. So if I happen to miss you, please introduce yourself in the chat bar on YouTube and we can say hello. But that is more than enough from me. I'd now like to turn it over to Beverly for today's Explorer Classroom lesson. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Celeste. This is so exciting to be talking to people from, from all over the world. <laughs> this is absolutely amazing, um, especially in this time when we're all, so many of us are at home, but to be connected so widely is just, just phenomenal. Um, so I, what I'm going to be talking about today is ancient tsunamis. And I'm gonna be talking about my research where I incorporate, just like Celeste was explaining, I take a, use a whole bunch of different tools to be able to answer questions about what happened in the past, and then to try to use that to be able to make things better for today. So I'm gonna be talking about, um, about tsunamis, I'm gonna be talking about my work, I'm gonna be talking about my, um, my, my field of research. Um, so should I go ahead and try and do a share screen again, Celeste? Is it ready? Sure, that would be great, Beverly. Okay, all right, let me throw that up. Hold on a second. Okay, great. Is it showing okay? Yeah, it's wonderful. Perfect. All right. Okay, so first of all, let me just uh, say a word or two about uh, what I do. Okay, I have a kind of funny name of a job. Okay, my, my, my job is a marine geoarchaeologist. Okay, so this means that I am, I mix together geology and archaeology, so that's the geoarchaeologist, and I'm working in the sea, okay, and I'm working, sometimes I'm even working in freshwater, but I'm, I'm working in water, so marine geoarchaeologist means that I'm 
doing this mixture between geology and archaeology, and I'm working underwater more much of the time, sometimes on land, which you'll, you'll see, you'll see in a few minutes. So what do I research? What are my questions? What do I, what am I trying to figure out? Well, I look at a lot of things. One of the things that I look at are what we call rapid events, okay, fast events, or what we call disasters, okay? So these are things that happen in sort of a short period of time, um, but can cause a lot of damage. So here in this picture, you can see us uh, filming a, a flash flood actually coming into the sea. So a lot of times I'm looking at these things today, and then I'm also trying to see, okay, when it happens, what does it look like so that I can see this in the old records, I can see this in the archaeological records. So other things I care about are sea level and coastal change. Okay, looking at how how beaches change and how buildings that are on the beach get affected by that, and also looking at things like human impacts. Okay, people have been having an impact on the planet for a really long time, and you may have heard about a lot of things that are you know big concerns today. You know how when you know litter and plastics and, and things where where we leave a lot behind and so today those are things are a concern but also looking at this over the long stretch of time okay looking at how did people when did we start doing this <laughs> when did we start having this this long impact on our planet and and what can we learn? You know, did we make mistakes in the past that we fixed? Um, are there are there things that are less or more damaging? So, so I'm looking at this from this sort of long time perspective. Okay, but the first thing I'm going to talk about is I'm going to tell you about an event that happened. Um, many of you weren't even born yet. Um, some of you maybe, but there was in, in the year 2004 there was a very, very large earthquake. If you see on this, this is a map of the Indian Ocean and where you see those stars, um, that line, that row of stars represents where there was a massive earthquake, a huge earthquake that, um, that was, was registered and, and felt even as far as away as Hawaii. Now, the earthquake was, offshore okay it happened in the ocean and and that that may sound like kind of a good thing right because if it happens in the ocean then it's not happening underneath a bunch of buildings you know so there's 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 the the good side of that but the problem is when that earthquake happened it created a tsunami okay and a tsunami i'm sure maybe you've heard of a tsunami before and today believe it or not before this tsunami happened not everybody knew what a tsunami was if you can believe that you know today we use tsunami when we're describing things when we say oh my gosh it was just a tsunami you know of, of problems you know it's something that that's kind of a slang word that we use in our everyday language but believe it or not before this tsunami happened what a mean nation if someone were to use the word tsunami it wasn't a word that everybody everybody knew and and the reason that people started to use the word was because of this earthquake and tsunami now it was a really really terrible event um and you know just to tell you a little bit about what happens and why tsunamis are, are quite unusual is that when a tsunami happens it's not like a regular storm wave okay you can have really big storms and you can have really bad damage from storms but the big difference with the tsunami is that it, it happens because of an earthquake or a volcano. It can even be from um, uh, uh, felling glaciers, glaciers falling or landslides on land or even underwater, meteorites. But what happens is the wave, when you're way offshore over here, okay, when you're out in the ocean, it's not really such a big wave. But as the wave comes in towards the shore, it's moving all that water. And you have to kind of picture that, I hope you can see my arrow, but if you, as this water is coming in, as the water is coming in, it doesn't change in size, okay? The water doesn't, it's gotta go somewhere. And so what happens is the, the way it'll develop these waves as it gets closer and closer to shore, and then all of that water's got to go somewhere. So when it gets to the coastline, the water doesn't turn to, it, to itself and say, okay, that's it, we're at the beach. You know, we don't go any further. The water just keeps going over the land. And that's why it's so very different than, you know, than um, storm waves. I mean, storm waves will also go inland a bit, but not as much as a big tsunami can. It can just, it, and it will damage everything in its way, in its path. Well, this 
photograph here is from that event. And the reason I'm showing you this photograph is that this is a very, very scary photo. And the reason that it's scary is that that white, that white foamy line that you see off in the distance, believe it or not, that is the wave coming in from that earthquake. But the scary thing about this is not really the wave, but it's these people, okay? You see these people who are standing there, they're checking it out and they're looking and they're having a nice day. They're out in their bathing suits, going for a stroll on the beach on a beautiful morning with you know sunny skies. And this is the thing that for me was just horrifying. And the reason it's so horrifying is that we know now what's gonna happen. That wave is gonna come and it's gonna keep going and many, 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 many people died. Okay, many people died. And many of them, just like these people you see here, stood and watched the wave coming in, okay? And so you have to think, oh my goodness, how could that happen and why would that happen? And, and a lot of it is because people simply weren't familiar. They didn't know about tsunamis and, and they didn't have the knowledge or the experience or the stories to tell them that, that this was a, a dangerous thing. So after the tsunami happened, Lots of research, researchers, researchers, you know, of course, first there was the rescues and first there was the disaster response. And you also had researchers who went to that place and started to look around and they wanted to see, okay, what happens when there's a tsunami and what does it look like? What does the place look like after a tsunami? And so you can see this picture up on the left is from some research where they're digging trenches and looking at, uh, looking at the tsunami layer, but you'll notice it looks like a birth cake, right? What's going on there? Okay, so that top layer that you see, that is the tsunami of 2004. But you'll notice that as you go down, there's another layer that that's like it and another layer and another layer and another layer. And the more the researchers started to look, they found that wait a second, this huge tsunami, this has happened before. Okay, this has happened before. And so you think, oh my goodness, if it happened before, how come people didn't know? What, what, why, didn't, why couldn't they have been ready? Why wouldn't they know the signs? Well, interestingly, in some of the areas where people were living more traditional um, populations that had been there for many, many generations in these areas, places like the Solomon Islands, and um, there are other islands where they have traditional living people um, like the Adaman Islands, they went to those places and they found that fewer people died you know, relative to the population, that there were fewer people died. And they started to interview and try to figure out, well, why? What happened there? And sure enough, part of it was this traditional knowledge that they noticed some things happening. They approached the elders, they discussed it, and then they, they remembered from the folklore and they got everybody away from the shoreline. And so some of the places that had this traditional um, folklore knowledge of these past events knew about it. But a lot of the people that were on the shorelines, many of them had only been there, moved there in the past 20, 30 years. Some of them were tourists who had never been there. So they had no reason to recognize the signs. Okay, so that's my sad story. We're going to start with the sad story. But now I'm going to show you sort of... Um, an alternate story uh, about tsunamis. Well, sorry, let's end that with saying, of course, after that happened, now throughout the, all of those countries in that area, they now have educational programs. And just like you have your different drills at school, when I was young, we had tornado drills where we would practice what to do in a tornado, they have tsunami drills. So they will have a drill where they will say, okay, and the sirens go off and they all know how to follow the evacuation and what to do if they have the signs that there might be a tsunami. So this of course will save many, 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 many lives. And it's incredibly important because so many people died in 2004. Um, in fact, almost, you know, some estimates are saying over 200,000 people, that is a lot of people, and they didn't have to. If they had known how to respond, it wouldn't have happened. Okay, so now I'm going to give you an alternate story. I'm going to give you a different story. Now, this drawing is a picture of an ancient harbor, an ancient harbor called Caesarea, which is located um, in the eastern Mediterranean um, off of the modern country of Israel, which is where I do my work. And this is just a drawing to give you a feeling. It was this massive Roman harbor. It would have 
um, been able to bring in very large ships. They would have brought grain from all over the region and beautiful things and, and simple things and everything you can imagine. Um, a gorgeous city with a, pal with a temple and you know, government buildings and all the typical things of a, of a Roman city. But the thing about this harbor is today the harbor is underwater, okay? So all of this dark, the, the dark patches that you see in this photograph from, a, from an airplane, that is actually the harbor sunken under the water. And so the question was, why? You know, when and why? Was this something that happened slowly over time or is it something that happened really quickly? And so archeologists and historians and geologists for many, many, many years we're studying this harbor and trying to figure out um, what was going on there. Was there a big earthquake? Was it, uh, was it done on purpose? How did, how did it happen? And I was part of those excavations. Um, I went there as a student and, and uh, volunteered and also got credits and, and studied there. And, um, and eventually was working with the, with the underwater team that actually went and excavated the harbor itself. And so for many, many years, we worked there. And we discovered that, in fact, the harbor seemed to have been destroyed pretty quickly. Okay, it happened quite fast, but we didn't know why. We knew it happened about 80, 90, you know, 100 years or so after it was built, but we didn't know how come. One year we were working, this is this picture down in the bottom is actually me many years ago. Um, and we came across this unusual layer and this is what it looks like. It may not sound very exciting because it's, you know, we're underwater and we're in the sea and it's shells. And you're probably thinking, well, of course you see shells when you're underwater, you know, show me some gold, but trust me, this is, this is, this is just as exciting. Um, but the thing that's really unusual is that this is a place where the sea floor is sandy. Okay, that's the normal seafloor. And this layer wasn't sandy, it was full of shell and ceramics and, and cobbles and pieces of stones. And more importantly, these shells that you see, these clams, they don't live in this depth. We found out that they were, they were brought there from much, much deeper. Okay, so some force had to carry it you know, miles away from where it lived and dumped it right outside the harbor. So we were able to get some dates on it. We used what's called radiocarbon dating. And we also had ceramics. We had pieces of pottery that could tell us when it was. And believe it or not, the age of this pile was the same age as when the harbor was destroyed. Hmm, interesting, right? So we went out and said, okay, let's figure this out. Maybe some big event that came from the water, that came from the deep and pushed all these shells and mixed all this material is why the harbor was destroyed. And so we had to take samples. We wanted to take samples from the whole area to see whether or not if it was a natural disaster, like a tsunami, we should probably see it everywhere, not just in our little excavation area. So what you're looking at here is a picture of of a, a core, okay? And so we put together this, this um, we put together this equipment where we basically take a pipe and we shove it into the seafloor. And just like a, a tree rings, we can read the layers in that core and go back in time. Okay, so we took a whole bunch of these. Here's a picture of the hammer that we put on top of it. I'm gonna show you a short movie in a minute so you can see how this works. Um, and, but we collect the core, we bring it to the lab, and then we start, we open it up, and then we look down through the layers and see whether we can find these jumbled, coarse, shelly layers like we saw in the excavation. Um, so I'm going to show you just a, a, some clips of a little movie about the harbor. What you're looking at here is a little explanation of how the harbor was built. Okay, this is a 2,000 years ago, they, they built the harbor by making artificial islands and covering it with, uh, with, um, uh, with uh, cut stones on top. And this is a nice little animation of what the harbor might have looked like. This is a film from National Geographic uh, that was about King Herod. And here we have underwater, okay? So if you can see underwater, this is what it looks like today. Those are columns that are covered in biological material that's encrusted on it. And Everywhere you look in this harbor, there's material that's, that's fallen or, or collapsed. I mean, it's just everything is man-made. It looks like a natural reef, but 
it, it, you have to believe me that it's not. These are the, underneath all of that growth is, is cement and things that came from far away. And here, what we're looking at are these two massive towers that sit inside, right outside the entrance of the harbor. And when we excavated there, one of the big mysteries was that we realized that these towers were on their sides. Something had knocked these huge towers over. So again, and then we figured out that this was the same time as this, this event happened, this destructive event. So here's some more images of what the harbor looks like today. So here's, here's just to explain how we get our core. So we're hopping in and the underwater, it looks like a construction site. We have all this equipment that we have to build and link together and, and uh, you know, bring all the pieces until we get that, that pipe finally in its position. There's the hammer. Okay, and the hammer is attached to the surface uh, to an air compressor. And then we just hammer it right in. And once it's in the ground, we attach it to ropes into an airbag, and then we pull it out of, of the bottom. Okay, and here you can see it coming up on the ship, and then you've got to open it up. Okay, so you know it's a little brutal, but this is this is a this is how we do it. Now you'll notice here, here's an example of a core that we opened. And when we're looking at it, those those parts of it, remember I told you that it's normally just nice sand. So you can see that there's these clean sandy layers and in between them we have these chunks of rubble okay that are they're interrupting it and in a way you can you can see even with the naked eye this very clear change okay these changes that are happening that you have the normal sand and then something happens and here look that's actually a piece of pottery believe it or not we caught a piece of pottery inside the core sometimes we get very lucky and you can see those shells those clams i was telling you about that that the poor guys got woken up in the morning and and got transported and shoved on a wave you know to miles away from their homes um, and so this, as we collected these cores, we realized, oh my goodness, not only are we able to follow along these cores, this one event that we saw in the archeological excavation, but uh-oh, it's not the only one, okay? So all of these lines that you see connecting between the different cores and the different excavations, those are re representing separate events. Okay, so not only was there this one event that damaged the harbor, but it turns out that this, these events are something that happens more than once, okay? That it's something that, that is common enough that we can see in this record from the archeology span and from the geology showing us that we have had these tsunami events in the past. So when this happened, of course, you know, it's very interesting, it told, explain to us a little bit more about what and why, uh, what happened with the harbor. But on the other hand, we went, oh my goodness, we have a problem because you know what? People live there. <laughs> and so we searched also all over the archeological site. Here's an example, here I am in a hole, you know, where we went to some of the areas where on the archeological site, they had, they had evidence that we thought, okay, let's go see how far inland did the tsunami get? And so we went through the archeological site and searched around and sure enough, we were able to find in different parts of the site, some of the remnants of these tsunami events. Here I'm, I'm crouched in front of a sand layer and that's actually a sand layer that, that filled up rooms right next to the harbor, okay, during one of these events. So we were able to go around the site and suddenly there were layers that, that, that for many years, nobody really knew why they were there. They had no explanation um, or they had explanations that didn't quite fit. And now that we have this information from the sea that we had all of these cores and excavation data and could show that we have this big event that moved things from the deep to the shallow and from the land to the sea, we were able to connect all of these, these mysterious deposits and, and be able to, to fully tell this story. Um, here, for example, in this room that was excavated, those, those large um, stones that you see are actually one side of this building that was collapsed in a wave that knocked the, the side of the building into the room. 
okay? Before they finished excavating, it was all filled with sand on top of that that had come in from, from the sea. Um, here's another, this is just another example that you can see in this room of this, the, the bottom of this destructive layer. You can see all that, this is after they removed a lot of the sand, but you can still see the remnants of some of that, that sand that came in and pushed the wall and, and made the wall collapse with all of the sand around it and all those individual building stones. You know, it's, it's a bit amazing to look at when you stand there, it's a bit alarming because you think, oh my goodness. But the good news I can tell for all of you watching is that underneath those stones and sand, we did not find any people, thank goodness. Nobody, nobody was hurt in this room. Um, and in fact, we actually found that probably the reason nobody was in the room was because the room was, had been used as a garbage pit. <laughs> and it's probably the same reason they didn't clean up after the tsunami because it was already a place that had been sort of abandoned and turned into a garbage pit. So that's the good news about this, this one uh, place. Thank goodness it was nobody's, nobody's home. Okay. So this is a nice little uh, sort of three-dimensional view of this room. So in that middle area, this, this is the side of the room that was destroyed during the tsunami. And all of these, all of these, uh, these bricks, of which are very large, are what the, the, were the walls of the room that were thrown in during the, during the tsunami itself. Okay, so I mentioned, okay, this is really interesting and this tells us about the history of this ancient city. But wait a second, this isn't a place where people live today, okay? So this is a picture of, um, from a few years ago of the beach uh, near Tel Aviv, you know, south of Tel Aviv. In the background, you see the, the town of Jaffa. And, you know, this is a place that's very popular and people go there and fill up the beaches in the summer. And it's, it's, it's you know, just like any beach you can imagine in Florida or, or somewhere like that. And, and of course, you remember that, that photograph from, uh, from the tsunami. And, and I thought, you know, this is, this is terrible. But this, the great news is, is that we brought this information to the government and the government took a look at it and they thought about it and they thought about this and they considered all of the data that we provided for them. And I'm happy to show you that this is what we have now on that same beach. Okay, so you can see Jaff in the background there. And so the government decided this is serious. The archeology span has shown us that this has happened. And so today when you go to these beaches, they have tsunami hazard zone warning signs all along the coast of Israel. And they also have directional signs so that if an event happens, and you can see on the top of this uh, pole, they have um, you know, sort of sirens and uh, they can announce from them. And if they, people hear, okay, there's, there's risk of a tsunami, there's also signs that tell them exactly how to evacuate and where to go and where to get to the safest places and how to find high ground as quickly as they can. Um, and so this, is, this to us is probably the most uh, rewarding and exciting uh, part of, of, of the entire research experience. Um, and um, so that's where, that's where I want to end my story and just say, well, thank you for all of you for, for being here. And I'm really excited for your questions. And this work has been supported by National Geographic peers, as well as you know, local, um, this is research in Israel. So the Israel Science Foundation and Ministry of Energy and Water and partnerships with many, many people. This, this slide would be very full if I put everyone's names on there, all the students and collaborators. And um, it's, it's a, a, a big effort of a lot of people over the years. And thank you. Amazing. Well, Beverly, your work is so incredibly cool. It's such a neat blend of high and low tech and land and sea and distant past and, and near future. It's just, it's really, really unique and cool. So thank you so much for taking us on that little tsunami detective project. For folks who are watching along at home, um, we'd love to see what your favorite part was. If you're going to do a follow-up activity, maybe from the family guide or the educator guide, you draw a picture, you make a comic strip, you produce a video, whatever it may be, we would love to see it. You can share I'd that. Love with to see <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can share that with us on Twitter at NatGeoEducation, hashtag Explore Classroom. It'll make Beverly's day. It'll make my day. We love to see your work. Um, it's now time for question and answers. 
Um, if you're on screen with me, get ready with a nice loud voice. I will tell you when it's your turn. If you're on YouTube, you can start sending in your questions in the chat bar. We keep track of all of the questions you send us, so you only need to send your question one time. Please don't spam us. Um, our first question today comes to us from Ben, who's nine years old and is wondering what the most unusual discovery you've ever made is. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> wow, there's quite a few that, that, um, that come to mind, but I, I, okay, I'll tell the one that, that um, is a little bit embarrassing, but it's probably one of the things that's most interesting. One of the excavations that we did, we were working um, off, of, off of this uh, part of the coastline that was north of the harbor, and we just wanted to see what the tsunami deposits look like there. And as we were excavating, we found the tsunami and we found the regular, we found the tsunami, we found the regular and everything was exactly what we expected. But then we found a layer of mud. Okay. I know that might sound like, so what? Mud, okay. I got mud on my shoes this morning, what's the problem? But what is really unusual is when we find mud, it means that you have a really calm situation, okay, like in a lake or a harbor, or it can mean that you dumped something there. And so when we looked back on the coastline and we mapped out where it was, we realized that we were actually directly off of an ancient sewage pipe. So we happened to excavate into an ancient sewage field. There are other words for sewage that I'm sure you can all think of. And, um, and that might sound like a bad thing, but actually it's really exciting because now we're taking that sewage, fill in the word you prefer, and we are looking at it to figure out um, what was the population? Uh, we can get genetic material out of it. We can get, um, we can look at it to find out little seeds and what kind of garbage and, and you know, there's, there's, there's all kinds of information in this lovely sewage. So, so this was, this was a pretty, ex pretty exciting surprise find. That is super gross and super wonderful. <laughs> sharing that with us. Let's you said lowbrow, highbrow, you know, highbrow, <laughs> high science, low science. There, that's where it really meets. We, yeah, we've learned a lot so far. We can laugh at ancient poop. I think that's fine. <laughs> um, let's take our next question from a student up on screen with us. We've got Alex H. who's representing the Lincoln Magnet School with us. Your microphone's on. Alex, what's your question? Hi, Alex. <laughs> Uh, right. Now that you have found all of uh, this evidence and amazing information and ways to keep everybody safe from tsunamis, uh, what is your next goal you want to achieve? Oh, that is such a great question. <laughs> um, wow. You know what? I love your question because one of the things in research is, you know, we're, we're passionate about what we do. And, um, and I'll be honest, you know, there's a part of me that once we discovered once they believed us and once they they acted on it it was this great relief and then it was like okay what now exactly the question you just asked me like okay now what you know am i going to find more tsunamis how does this help us we're already doing something about it so so one of the things that i am hoping to do is to take this technique okay especially the technique of working in offshore okay working underwater because one of the problems is that there are a lot of places around the world where they really don't know what their tsunami risk is because they have no historical records of it. No one ever lived there. And, the, and there are so many more people on the planet today and the populations are growing so much and people are living in places and building cities where no one lived before. And the reason that no one lived there is because they couldn't. They didn't have air conditioning. They couldn't ship all their food there. There were places where it wasn't a very nice place for people to live, like especially places that are super hot or super, you know, just uh, not very easy to live without all these modern, you know, all the modern technology that we have today. And so my hope is that, and I'm, and I'm, uh, and I'm working towards this in, in other places, is to go to those kind of places to help to help them know what their tsunami risk is so that they can also have the, the drills and they can also have the warnings and that they can you know, prepare better in those places. So I'd like to go and try to help them save lives in other places too. That's amazing. Let's take our next question from Patricia and Julian. Your microphone's on, what's your question? Um, where else in the world uses the tsunami warning 
other than this. Oh, wow. Okay. So the program, um, the signage program that I showed you there, it's, it's used internationally. Um, I'm sure we must have some people here from California that might've seen this along their coastline. Um, and there's even the symbols that we use. There's, there's a few sort of standard signs that, that, that we use so that somebody who's from another country, if they're visiting somewhere else should be able to recognize it. Um, so you can see these kind of signs. I, everyone laughs at my phone. You know, some people have selfies. I have selfies of myself with, uh, with tsunami signs. <laughs> so everywhere I go in the world, when I see a tsunami warning sign, I usually take a picture of myself with the tsunami sign because um, it, it's very interesting to see what they look like in different places in the world. So you can see them in Japan and of course around the Indian Ocean. Um, there's still a lot of places that need to work on it. You know, and and um, I'm working with some collaborators and colleagues in countries that also have tsunami risk, but they haven't yet worked on their public programs. Great. Well, we've got an easy one for you, Beverly. A bunch of people in the YouTube chat bar are asking you a yes or no question. They're asking, is that a fish tank behind you? <laughs> it is. It is a fish tank. And you know, before the coronavirus, I used to feel sort of guilty about the, the poor fish not being able to swim freely. And then during Corona, I actually felt jealous of them that I couldn't go into the tank <laughs> since I've missed going and, and, and swimming myself. So, so yes, this is, this is a tank. This is our, this is our, our family tank. <laughs> Love that. We've got Steven and Kyra who uh, heard about tsunamis. Very intimidating, very scary. Have you ever witnessed one? I have not. I have not witnessed firsthand a tsunami. Um, thank goodness. And um, I also sometimes joke around that I'm probably one of the few scientists that would really prefer never to be proven right in my lifetime. <laughs> if I'm proven right about the, the danger of the tsunamis, um, it means that I'll, I will, you know, in my lifetime experience a tsunami because I, I actually live in Israel. So I I will see, you know, if I see those tsunamis. Um, so I have not uh, personally witnessed a tsunami. Most of the research I do, I'm going to the place either, you know, a while after it happens, or I'm focused, I'm really focused on the ancient tsunamis. So most of the tsunamis, I'm looking at, at the mess it left behind um, a long time ago. Speaking of the mess that it left behind, we've got Helenga who's wondering if the tsunami affects animals who live underwater too. That is a really good question. Um, so this is interesting. Yes, it does. Naturally, of course it does because um, like I showed you, you know, we have these clams that we know are eroded out, you know, that they're lifted out of their habitat and moved. So obviously most of them don't survive that. And, um, and so there's, there is a, a lot of damage that can happen. Um, you know, it really depends on which, uh, you know, which animals, animal, you know, fish and things that are able to, you know, some people have wondered whether th there's some, um, um, you know, whether they sense it happening and, and some of them might flee or, or, or try to try to get protected. Some of the first things that were noticed after the tsunami in 2004 were things like coral damage. And, you know, of course things are getting, broken and moved around. Um, but, you know, I should probably uh, mention that, you know, one of the things that they've also learned is that having a natural habitat, so having coral reefs, having mangroves, you know, not disturbing the, the coastal environment um, create, can create a natural buffer. And so one of the problems that we have around the world is that we have we have taken over the coastlines and we've built up so much on the coastlines, just like the Romans the Rom did in the harbor of Caesarea. And because we've changed it and manipulated it and unfortunately destroyed a lot of the natural coastline features, we don't have that natural protection anymore. So this is one of the things that we've, we've unfortunately learned. You know, one of the best ways to protect from a tsunami is to not be on the coastline, <laughs> you know, to have a buffer before you have a city or, you know, have, have places that people are going to go. Cool. Um, we've got a bunch of questions from the students at Franklin School. Miss Burke's class is wondering uh, what you wanted to be when you were a middle schooler and how you got to this career. 
a middle schooler. Oh my goodness. Okay, let me think. Oh, okay. Um, so I will have to confess that I never had a favorite subject, but I definitely had favorite teachers. So my favorite subject would usually change depending on who my favorite teacher was. <laughs> In fact, even my grades reflected what I thought of the teachers. So my parents used to say, you know, the teachers are grading you, you're not grading the teachers. So I had to learn that. Um, so there, I had a lot of different things I was interested in doing. I did have an interest from a young age in being an archeologist, but I also thought about being a veterinarian. Um, I was interested in architecture and I even wanted to be a National Geographic photographer. Um, that was actually one of my, my mega dreams was to be a photographer for National Geographic. But what I, what I would let all of you know or share with all of you is that, um, you know, some people know from a really young age, I know exactly what I want to do. And I remember when I was little, I used to get so frustrated because people would ask me this question and I, I would think, oh, okay, and I would, you know, come up with an answer. And that would change six months later, or I wouldn't really want to do that anymore. And I, and a lot of times I felt a lot of pressure, like I was supposed to know, <laughs> and I really didn't know. And what I discovered is that I now understand why I didn't know, because when I was young, I didn't know that there was such a thing as a marine geoarchaeologist. <laughs> this was never a career option. And so I share this with you, because just to understand that sometimes the most important thing really is to go after things that interest you. Don't think too much about whether it's gonna be your career. And you would be surprised because if you're doing things that you really like, it's gonna be more fun for you. You're gonna get more into it. You're going to, um, it's gonna be easier for you. And a lot of times, you know, the thing that you might do, you know, as a career or for part of your career, you know, down the road, it might be a mixture of all these different things. At least that was my experience. So, so yeah, I had a, I had a real variety of interests. Love that, wonderful advice. We've got Miss McKelvey up here with us and her students from West Craven Middle School. Would you like to call on a student or ask a question for your kids? Um, I would if they're there and I shot them a, a message privately. I know that I personally have a question and I'm fairly certain that one of my students, Davin Berger has a question. Yeah. She uh, put so many emojis in our Google Classroom about this event. So Davin, if you are there, I'll bet you have a question. All right, Davin, I just turned your microphone on. What's your question? Are you there? <laughs> all right. It looks, okay. It's you instead, Miss McKelvey. It's okay. That's all right. So my question is, I know, first of all, thank you so much, um, Beverly. This has been amazing. And I think, you know, especially working with middle schoolers, we're all kind of like what you just said, you know, there's this pressure on them to be a certain thing or already make a decision about what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And I think Davin is with us now, actually. But my question then is how did you decide to really make it specific as far as, I mean, I've never heard of, let me see, a marine <laughs> geoarchaeologist. I, you know, all the other components, yes, but to be able to hone it in on that one particular title, which I know incorporates so much, yeah. but as far as the specifics and narrowing it down, especially mm -hmm. as people are kind of looking at what's next in their lives. So what would be your advice on that? Um, okay, so, you know, it, it obviously, it took me quite a while, you know, and I began, um, I'll, I'll tell a little bit about sort of my trajectory. Um, when I, when I finished high school, I had a wonderful physics teacher. So naturally, I decided to be a physics major. <laughs> so, and, and that didn't last and very quickly, um, you know, my first semester as a as a science physics major, I realized I missed photography. So I switched over to photography, believe it or not, from physics, because that would be the natural progression. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and then I, at some point, I said, wait, wait, stop, stop, stop. And I began studying anthropology. Okay, and anthropology is a very incorporative sort of science. You know, it's 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 biology and geology and evolution, and um, and it and it gave me for me personally, it, it gave me sort of this freedom to think about um, 
very you know holistically about about how different things sort of connect and you know and through that um i was also taking i really love geology courses though i never thought about making it a major so i had been taking those at the same time so it, it wasn't until i i went to graduate school to do anthropology and i decided to spend a summer in Caesarea and and you know actually before, right before uh, the, my last year of my undergrad I decided to get some summer credits and it really was um, it wasn't motivated by wanting to work in Roman archaeology but I was motivated by okay I'd like some archaeological experience and I'm still there <laughs> so you know I mean really I, I, I think it's so important um, to try to stay open-minded and not to question too much when when you find something interesting or enjoyable you know that's one of the saddest things that i hear sometimes where someone will say oh yeah i took an archaeology course but ugh, nobody ever makes a career out of that you know so so you know you're kind of negating things because you don't know someone well i didn't know any marine geoarchaeologists and that only happened because as i i got more involved and got involved in research questions and met a geologist who was doing underwater sedimentology and met someone else and 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 so it kind of came together and it came together you know and, and the reason that i went on to do a phd wasn't because i wanted to be dr goodman um it was because it, it is a career where i knew to do what I was doing, it needed to be in an academic research setting. If I didn't have to do the PhD, I wouldn't have done the PhD. But I did the PhD because it was, it was, you know, for this career road, that was that was a requirement. So so yeah, so it it, it evolved over time. And I, I think that the best advice I have really is, you know, is to to be open-minded about it and to do well in everything that you approach. And also don't, don't feel, um, you know, when something, when something doesn't click, it's okay, you know, keep your eyes open. Look at, look at the other things that, that, are, that are working, that are making sense. And, you know, and, and just to kind of accept that every, everyone learns a little bit differently. Everyone, you know, learns the lesson in a different way. And, you know, and I think it's just about really being open-minded and, and finding that route. Amazing. Thank you. Smart <laughs> question in the chat bar from Mary, who is wondering who is in charge of setting off those sirens and what are the indicators that happen in order for them to turn those sirens on? Very, very good. Okay, so there's a whole sequence of, um, of uh, actions that, that fall into line. So there is a network that is regional. Okay, so there is a tsunami warning system that, because of course this is planet Earth, you know, it's not any single country that would be affected if there is an earthquake in the Mediterranean that's going to create a tsunami, it's going to affect a lot of different countries. So there's actually a network of tsunami warning systems where all the different countries, um, especially for here, we talk about the Eastern Mediterranean, so, you know, even sometimes Italy is involved, but basically Greece and Turkey and um, Cyprus. And so if there's an earthquake, the first thing that happens is that there's an alert that um, comes to that group of, of uh, tsunami alert people. They assess the situation. They have models that they run very quickly. Okay, so literally, um, the, I'm not that person in Israel. There's, there's a, a woman in our um, in our um, oceanographic institute, uh, who who is responsible, she'll literally be woken up in the middle of the night. You know, she sort of has a an alarm that will go off, and she's got to wake up, open her computer, get the model running, and determine whether or not they have to announce um, a warning or an alert. Okay, and that depends on how big was the earthquake, where did it happen, um, do the models show that it's expected to um, have damage. Now, depending on the source of the tsunami, we have different different times. Okay, if it's if the earthquake is further away, we might have warning of 60 minutes. Um, if if it's something that happens closer to us, it might be as little as 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, so so this has to happen really really fast. Um, and then if, once she's made that decision, she will she will let um, the um, the uh, the national um, 
emergency, uh, uh, sorry, what's the term for it? The, um, <laughs> I'm having a translation issue in my head, um, but essentially the, the, the national emergency response will then put out the alarm and set off the, the sirens and the announcements. Um, and they'll even have helicopters that will take off and go down the beaches and announce from the tsunami, or sorry, from the helicopters as well to help clear the beaches. And this is practiced in the drills. What an amazing and important job, much like your own. Thank you so much for joining us today, Beverly. It has been so cool. Um, we have so many more really, really smart questions in the chat bar that we don't have time. I know, I'm watching them. I'd love to answer them. I know. <laughs> so, uh, where where could folks send you questions that that it isn't right here on Explorer Classroom? Is there a, a social oh, media? Oh, sure. Well, I can be I can be contacted um, directly. Um, my email is just goodmanbeverly at gmail.com. Um, I also have a website, uh, Goodman Beverly, also Beverly Goodman, that you can go in and contact me there. And I'm happy to answer more questions. And I'd love to see your drawings or videos. That would be wonderful. Amazing. Well, for all of you awesome question askers out there on YouTube, send her your questions. They're so smart. I was so impressed by them. I wish we had time for every single one of them. Uh, be sure to check out Explorer Classroom and many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. I hope to see you at more events. At two o'clock Eastern time tomorrow, we're going to be talking to photographer Joel Sartore about his quest to photograph all the world's species and build a photo arc with their portraits. It's going to be really, really cool. I hope to see you there. But for now, I want to sign off for this YouTube broadcast. So nice and loud students, go ahead and say goodbye and thank you to Beverly. Ready? Beverly, really, 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 really,